So welcome everybody. Today I'm glad to introduce you uh, Arisi Wola from Aalto University. Uh, normally this stage is where, where I'm reading the bio, uh, but I think it's not necessary. So I will just uh, leave the stage to Professor Siwola and uh, I'd like to welcome him uh, on behalf of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very good for this introduction and, and of course for the very kind in, in, in invitation to talk to you. And of course, th thanks to IEEE um, yeah, for, for sponsoring this activity for the <coughs> my Middle Eastern tour. And, and I'm very glad to be here on my first visit in, in, in Ankara in the Middle Eastern Technical University. Happy to see so many of you here. I heard that this is also a PhD um, educational activity. So I hope that you get something out of my presentation. Um, I've been working in many, many, many areas um, in, in electromagnetics, remote sensing, and so on. And, and the thing that I would like to today talk about, we, we discussed this uh, previously and, 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 and decided that this kind of a, perhaps a general view on how, uh, at least I, look at materials from the electromagnetic point of view. And it's in particular, this kind of the new paradigm, as you, if you will, of metamaterials, how I, 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 I see that, because I guess you are so interested in this kind of things. So, so my, my, my idea would be somehow to focus on these kind of things. But first, um, to say you where I come from, as you can see, Finland is there, and you, you can see that Finland is the center of the world. <laughs> and and uh, my, my city, my city is, is here in, in, the, in the southern part of Finland, Espoo, where my university, which is called Aalto University, is located. It used to be called Helsinki University of Technology. It had a long history, but ten years ago we merged together with economics and arts and design to become Aalto University. All right, <coughs> to, to get to the topic, I would like to introduce, uh, uh, get an idea, perhaps a very, something that you have heard before. This is Richard Feynman, who, who, who in, in, in 59 uh, uttered the famous verse saying that there is plenty of room at the bottom. So what did he mean by that? Of course it is metaphorical. It means that downstairs somehow we, we, we cannot go there to the, to the bottom. Matter, if you start looking closer and closer and, and with microscope, always has new scales and levels there. And of course, that time he was a famous person in, in terms of developing the quantum physics. He knows that then they, 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 in, in that level you have, when you go to, down to 10 to the minus 10 meters, have, have the atomic distances and then the microscopic description of electromagnetics already fails. However, from there to our everyday life level, one meter level, there is enormous amount of, of, of space. And, 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 yeah, and, and you go there and there and always new things happen there. And, and that time, 50s, there was no nanotechnology, so it was very, like, I mean, a prophetic way of, of, of looking at the things. Of course, nowadays we go there and we somehow go deeper and deeper. It is like Somehow I see that it is like the ecological problem of Amazon as we just <laughs> go, go and, 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 and exploit everything going deeper and deeper. But somehow I feel that, and I hope in the coming uh, uh, six hours that I will be talking, then you will learn how, how, how I understand this thing. So, so these are, I, I put some uh, this morning. Uh, I put some uh, uh, keywords that, that, that I would be talking about, and let's see whether, whether I have time to talk about all of these, but anyway. And by the way, if you would like to somehow ask something more, more details, please free, feel free to interrupt me, because I didn't prepare a very fixed, fixed presentation here. But anyway, this, first I would try to talk about this, what I already talked something about this, like a philosophical view. Of, 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 of how uh, we look at things in different scales and levels and how we have different view of the world at that level. Uh, then also the, 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 uh, how, how I see
see that geometry and matter somehow are linked in a way. I'll come back to that later. And then the uh, important co concept which I feel that in this metamaterial business is important is so-called emergence. I'll, I'll, take, I'll tell you about that later. Then something about perhaps more down to earth. I've been working very much on so-called plasmonics. I, perhaps you know that, but I will tell you something more about that. And, <clears throat> and then some kind of interesting electromagnetic effects in materials. Um, since I know that you, your, your expertise here is very much in computational electromagnetics, so I try to squeeze in something on that. Although myself, I'm not, not a really computational electromagnetic, I'm very like a classical type of thing and, and fundamental uh, green function person. Uh, but, but anyway, I work very much with my colleagues who, who have very good expertise and, and tools for computations and, and, and that kind of cooperation has given very interesting results, what I, if I have time, I would really like to show you in the end of my talk. So, metamaterials in a way <coughs> is, a, is a word you may have heard, of, like a, which had perhaps quite a lot of hype, if you want to say, uh, it will be very like a, like a buzzword with which people are saying that they are perhaps uh, doing the same things that they did before, but, but perhaps it might have good applications and and people <coughs> and organizations who fund research may have been recently quite, quite, quite positive to this type of thing. Although I feel that if you now go to conferences, the metamaterial world is going down, but nowadays people will talk about metasurfaces more. So instead of three dimensional, most two dimensional things. So, um, <coughs> so uh, and it comes then clear when, when I will now focus on these scales. So, my, my uh, somehow I, I look at materials in the way, if, if you start from levels, you are here up uh, or, or down, as I mentioned. Plenty of room at the bottom. So, if I want to, <coughs> want to look at a material, so I was earlier working on, on very much on remote sensing, that we had snow, have snow now very much, one meter snow. And, and snow was something, but when I did my master thesis, that was about measuring the properties of snow. So snow, if you look at the, the picture of snow, and in fact I have it here, uh, this is wet snow. It is a very random structure. But it has, in, 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 in terms of matter, it is very simple. There are only three components. Air, free space, then liquid water, and ice. All these three have very extremely well-known dielectric properties. Air, air is very simple, dispersion is epsilon one, no magnetic properties. Water is of course so important to the humankind that it has been studied so much we know all its spectral properties over the, uh, all, the, all, the, all the range. And ice, in fact also, in microwaves by the way, ice is very interesting because it is very flat dispersion. 3.17 is the permittivity from, from very low frequencies up to, I don't know, even tens, hundreds of gigahertz. And perhaps you know Kronis, chronic relations which give, put together the, the real part and the imaginary part of the, of the frequency dependence of the permittivity. So if the real part is flat, it means that there is very little loss. So it's very loss, lossless. Just like watering our uh, optical range. We can see very clearly through water. Water is very lossless there and very flat dispersed. Not totally flat as you can see from the rainbow. So, so it is a little bit different in different uh, ways. Anyway, so uh, let's go back to my picture here. So that is here. We have the physical structure. But then sometimes in my uh, application a long time ago, I wanted to know Oh, we wanted to know that the satellite measures either the passive radiation from the Earth, which is then de <coughs> determined by the uh, conditions of the Earth, the temperature and, 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 and the dielectric properties, electromagnetic properties. But of course, in, it measures a big, big area, footprint is large. There is no need to know the exact physical structure. I only want to know what is the macroscopic electromagnetic response of that material, snow, ice, vegetation, soil, whatever. 
So the way is that I want to go up. I want to have the permittivity, permeability. Here I have put some other. It could have other uh, physical parameters also. But they are then <coughs> somehow you go to less numbers at degrees of freedom. So how to go from there? So normal model is that 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 there is a ice grain, so it has certain per permittivity. It can be then uh, computed how much it creates electromagnetic perturbation if you put electric field there, what is its dipole moment and so on. It can be calculated depending on shape and, 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 and permittivity. So it is like a collection of, of, of dipole moments which already forget very much of the details, but we get numbers. And from here then uh, we somehow add not nearly average but homogenize those. Get effective permittivities. So, green arrow go up, but also we can have another way. way. We can go down. And this is then, perhaps in this building here, yeah, there are antenna engineers who, who have a clever design for a 5G. We were talking about 5G the other day. And then, uh, and then <coughs> if only we had a um, dielectric layer which would have this kind and that kind of properties, epsilons and those. This would be a wonderful antenna. Okay, then the question is how to go down, how to design that kind of synthesize that kind of structure. So, <clears throat> in a way, so that is the yellow thing here. So the synthesis, we can want to materialize, we want to realize, we want to fabricate something. Oh, then my green arrow goes going up, which means that somehow I, instead of looking at the total totality of the, all the structural details I somehow parameterized or homogenized or project that to less number of <coughs> degrees of freedom. So <coughs> these both <coughs> ways are extremely interesting. For example this one, it means it is because this is like as I would claim it is like a non-unique way. So there are many possibilities of fabricating or, or, or realizing a given macroscopic permittivity. So, in a way, you can think of the snow, shape the snow box a little bit. Perhaps the, per the permittivity didn't change at all, but it is a different realization. So that is non unique. However, this one is perhaps even more interesting. Of course, what we lost, we lost the beautiful, my, you remember my snow picture which had lots of details, in, uh, enormous amount of, 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 of structural degrees of freedom, if I want to describe that exactly. But I don't care, I, I, I lost, lose all the details. However, something what happens is, and now this is the, the question that what I'm coming to, is that <clears throat> I come to the higher level. Remember I'm talking about these scales down to the Feynman bottom. Uh, there is in a way like a different language when we go upstairs. And with this I, uh, I, I have to explain you by a couple of examples. We are in electrical engineering uh, uh, and, and, and there I, I have now two examples here. One is, is, is the one last night with, with, with Sakri and Gökhan we went to the tea late in the evening and discussed quite a lot about the computer science and, and things that happened there. So one thing that came was this cellular neural networks. That is a fascinating idea that I don't know too much about. But anyway, first of all, this idea of electromagnetics. I'm an electromagnetics teacher, so I teach field theory, I ask the questions, and so on. But then uh, next door, there is my colleague who teaches circuit theory, a very, very, very solid discipline in electrical engineering, where you talk about resistors and capacitors and upper, uh, amplifiers and so on. However, we think that we talk about the same thing, but, but I uh, solve a problem of, say, a resistor. I have to ask what is the electric field at each point, which is a field problem, and then the property of the material, what is the conductivity, what is then the uh, current density. And then that is like a three-dimensional, four-dimensional, like temporal thing also there. 
Whereas with certain theory guys, they are, they are zero dimensional because they integrate in everything. I don't care, it is just the resistivity of the capa capacitance what I need. All the details are washed away. So even in this kind of short, uh, um, uh, like a, a step over the levels, then we start talking about different things. And then indeed, I mean, there in the circuit theory, there are fascinating things that I know very much about. The certain person called Leon Shua developed this kind of uh, cellular uh, systems in which there are very simple rules, but then, then the non-linearity creates quite unexpected effects. And that's why, okay, I come back to this later, but another one is this, this that is, I never have understood, but my colleagues in the uh, how do you call it? telecommunication department, I don't know whether you have that kind of colleagues, they, at least I've heard, have this kind of open system, uh, like a, a categorization of the systems in telecommunications, in which you have the different layers, as they say, physical data, network transport, and so on, layers. The physical layer there means that there is the real coaxial cable. Although that is already very, perhaps even higher than the circuit theory, and the, I feel that I am even much more deeper down there with the electromagnetics. But then if you go up, up here, that is called going to the internet and all those things, and, and the people in different layers, they talk different language in a way. So I think it is in a way of language sometimes. If you do multidisciplinary work, talking with chemists, it takes a long time to understand, oh, now we talk about the same thing, but we have different words for that. So, uh, I, I just would like to, I, I stop with the philosophy very soon and come a bit more down, down to earth, but anyway, the, the idea of the emergence, I mentioned already that this arrow going up. So we lose a lot, but we gain something new. Something new happens. And I will give you examples of I have to call it emerges. Perhaps that is a bit fuzzy philosophical con concept, but anyway, don't worry. Something emerges, something new. So in a way, you one plus one is more than two. You know, you people, somebody has a beautiful voice. See, another one also. But it, they sing together in the choir. That is much more than, 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 than their sum of the parts. How do you say? This is the, the, the way. However, many <coughs> hardcore physicists say that no, 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 it's exactly the opposite. You said that you lost lots of details. And of course I did that. I don't anymore remember what kind of the snow structure was there. And then I, I just have fewer parameters. So it is like reductionism. Many, some physicists may be of this opinion. So chemistry goes back to physics, and physics goes back to elementary particle physics, and so on. Biology, biology goes to biochemistry. Chem, biochemistry goes to chemistry. And then whatever you call psychology, sociology. Who believes that? <laughs> I, I, I think that that is a dangerous thing, even if but realistically, we might say that okay, everything is explainable down to the elementary particle physics. But because it's so difficult, there are so many layers that even the best computer in the world cannot do that. So better, better believe in this emergence. So in a way, I, I feel this is a little bit of the same thing that they, when you do this kind of metamaterial structure out of elements. Very often, metamaterial people say that. The, the very idea of metamaterial is that it somehow displays something, first of all, something that doesn't exist in the nature, but something that doesn't exist in the comp component materials. So something new emerges there. In a way, like children say that children are perhaps, this is like an inheritance step. Higher level property inherits the, 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 the properties and geometry and everything down there. But, um, uh, but anyway, something new appears there, so as, 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 as in the human generation source. Another one, one thing is, perhaps this is not about the emergence, but about the thing that I mentioned, this, um, the 
this uh, non-uniqueness of the realization. So if we go down, we want to have some kind of uh, effective material and, and try to so, realize that it can be done in different ways. So a good example is this. This is the work, even not my work, I, I read it from Philip Anderson, who is a famous physicist, about multiple platforms. There are many ways, many platforms in which you can create something new. Exa a beautiful example is a computer, because a computer can be realized by uh, transistors or can be realized by, by I don't know, optical elements or quantum computer or, 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 or even mechanical bulbs and so on. But that is not an essential. Essential is the logic, how the computer works. Like you go to your colleagues in the computer science and say that, no, 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 your, your, your discipline is reducible to elementary particle physics. So they will be very angry, I guess. And I am fairly certain, I have to say. So, uh, and this is by what, what I added now because of, of this, our last uh, night's discussion. So, uh, I don't know, I use very much Mathematica, you know this wonderful software. Uh, and, and the person who designed that, Stephen Wolfram, also has, has done many, many other things. And he wrote a book on new kind of science, in which he has many, I have to say, a bit controversial uh, uh, claims. But anyway, something that I find very much connected to this metamaterial e emergence thing is the following. He, talks about so-called cellular, oh, he quotes so some, something about the computational irreducibility or something like this, which is a fascinating thing, and I show it by a similar example here. So, uh, this is the, with Mathematica you can do, I did all this with Mathematica, it is very simple, simple commands. Uh, this means so that, uh, what is it, there is a state which is now a simple world, it is just like a one-dimensional line of elements. And the elements can be on or off, or you can have different states. And then there is a rule that after next step, if the, the, the element changes or doesn't change its state, depending on whether uh, here before it was on or off, and its two neighbors are on or off. As you can see, the three neighbors are affecting. So very local rules, very simple rules here. Eight rules, eight possibilities for, for the, and these are now the rules. So if you start from here and then apply these rules to each of these, then the next thing is this one. Then the next thing is this one, and so on. So it is some sort of rule two, five, here. And you can see that then it, develops into very dull, simple structure. There are others also. Here is another rule, and now you can see a strange fractal, but very regular structure appears. But then, what happens is that if you use rule 30, you just change a little bit of this, then all the regularity disappears. And, and in fact, then I, I if this kind of simple thing, I, I, I did another one, another rule here, and then I put three colors here. And then, okay, it, this doesn't seem to have any regularity, and if you run it for thousands and thousands of things, it looks like this. So if I magnify something from there, so there is no regularity. So even if the rules is extremely simple. So this is, I, I think, very fascinating, and I guess Wolfram says that it is even extremely, that this is how nature is. So it is a very simple, small subset of problems which we can somehow shortcut in a way uh, 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 by, by saying that the, the, the initial conditions are like this, the rules are like this, I know what the result is. No, it is irreducible. The only way to see what happens in the future is go through the steps. So, so this is somehow, I, I find it fascinating how that kind of simple rules can create complex behaviors. Okay, so that is about computer science, but, but, but I'm myself more interested in, in the electromagnetics and physics. But there also, this kind of emergence, I can, 
I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, the, the, the <coughs> First of all, so this is a technical term, anisotropy. Uh, isotropy means somehow that that the thing is independent on direction. So, so in, in, in terms of the response of an electric material, uh, because we know that the electric excitation is a, has a vector direction, so electric field points to a certain direction. So it uh, hits an object, and the object becomes polarized. How strong the polarization is, is maybe dependent on the direction of the field. So if it depends, then the, the, the material is anisotropic. Most of, many materials are isotropic, like water. Doesn't matter, it is very well mixed. There is no, no, no special direction. However, if I take a very simple mixture, I take a background, say, neutral plastic, and then I put, for example, metal needles. Both the plastic and metal are isotropic simple materials. However, if all these are aligned like this, then it is easy to understand that if I hit with the electric field, it has vertical polarization. It creates a very strong response because these metal needles are like antennas. However, if I have horizontal polarization, it is much less. So somehow geometry created a new property in matter, anisotropy, which is again an um, emergent, well, at least in my opinion, emergent property in the higher, again, you have to go in the higher level, in the larger scale. Even more fascinating is, is so-called chirality, I'll come to that later. It means that there is a handed uh, character in the geometry of the medium. Here is spiral, as you can see, left-handed, right-handed, they are mirror images of each other. I'll come back to that later. Artificial magnetism, you know we have magnetic materials already. I guess in this country you invented <laughs> 3,000 years the magnetism already, or 2.5 thousand years. Uh, but that means that there, is, that there are natural materials like, like iron or, 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 or man-made materials, steel and, and so on, which may have in, its, in, them, in themselves the magnetic property. However, we know from electromagnetic equations that electricity and magnetism are coupled. So if we have a circulating loop, uh, uh, electric current in a circle, it is equivalent to a magnetic moment. So you could, having with no magnetic materials, create magnetic effects. So I think that is a beautiful example of emergence. And then, of course, also these <coughs> photonic band caps. I was we were discussing yesterday also about uh, photonic crystals and so on. I, I guess I have a picture of that. But the, the message is that, that geometry creates matter in that sense, emergent matter. Uh, here, I, I just put this one because this is fascinating. The, the electromagnetic band caps, or optical, how do you say, photonic band caps, or photonic crystals. This was again another buzzword, say, I don't know, 20 years ago. And physics people were talking about that, and then many electrical engineers were very, very like annoyed because very good structures had been studied for already from the 50s. You know that this is like a one dimension, a layer structure, very regular thing. Two different materials can be just dielectrics, no losses, no conduction. And then, due to the interference, this may have a total reflection at a certain way. You can do it in 3D, 2D or 3D dimension. Yavlorovich has been a famous person in, in this respect. And that is, that is interesting because in a way, again, this geometrical interference creates something which only metal can do. And there is no metal here. And in the nature, I took this one, that, that article, the people have studied with microscope, the butterfly wing of the peacock feather, which have beautiful colors, but they are not like a, this one, which is like a pigmented thing, that, that there is a, a absorption or reflection spectrum in the optical sense. There is, there are only lossless heating here, 
but that has a regular structure. It is like a photonic crystal, which means that a certain wavelength it has a total reflection and creates beautiful uh, colors here. So that is again one example of this what I say now. Okay. So there were a couple of examples about the um, uh, uh, emergence thing. So remember now the uh, the computer thing, uh, the, 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 the anastropy thing, photonic band gaps. Now I will talk something more about the chiral. And for that I would then give a couple of equations. So I hope, I guess you have been uh, had classes on electromagnetics and on physics on, on, on materials. So the way to somehow uh, solve Maxwell's equations, you know there are curls of E, but then on the other side there are B or D, which are the flux densities electromagnetic. And the idea is to con con connect these B and H and D and E, so the electric field and the flux density and so on. Free space, it is very easy because they are the same thing, only the free space permittivity, permeability there. But material is, is nice because then you can condense everything into the material constitutive parameter. Like here, this epsilon we call permittivity. So the, in absolute terms, this is volts over meter and this is per second over square meter. But it, this has the, has the units of per second over volt meter. But anyway, that's perhaps irrelevant. The important thing is that there is a relative permittivity. The bigger this one is, the bigger is the capacity of that material to store electric energy. Okay, but I said that uh, if, 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 if we have an isotropic material, so homogenized, remember my needle thing. For example, a good example is, is, is you know, some people have Polaroid glasses which I imagine that are exactly like that, that they, they, they suppress one of the uh, optical polarizations away. So there has to be some kind of uh, 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 different response, different attenuation if the optical wave or the electric field is this way or that. So then it means that no, we cannot have a single number. We have to have, in general, three to three. This has to be matrix or dyadic or tensor of second rank, nine parameters. And now, then I do it even even more difficult. I, I say that, okay, but what about if, okay, D is epsilon E equals here, and B, the magnetic response has the magnetic permeability times H. So there are magnetically active materials that may have mu, not the same as the free space or not magnetic. But I allow also cross coupling here. That's what I call bionastropic or magnetoelectric coupling. So let me. So then, this kind of simple understanding would give the number of three degrees of freedom. Isotropic, we only have the two electric and magnetic single scalar parameters. Would be complex for loss of speed. So uh, anisotropy, then that these both can be matrices. Okay, eighteen parameters, and then if we have two to two, and all can be three by three matrices, it is already thirty-six parameters. There is fascinating special case, so-called bi-isotropic media, which are so, so well mixed that there is no special direction. Never the, I put electric field this way or that way, the response in magnitude is the same. However, I allow for this cross -cut. And now I, I explain to you the physical possibilities for this one. And that is another example of this emergence. Oh, by the way, but, but one, one thing that I'd like to mention is that the word came in Professor Connor's uh, uh, doctoral thesis. He gave me this, that one, and he, I think that this is the first place where they used that word, dynamic uh, and isotropic. So by meaning that there is magnetoelectric coupling, and isotropic meaning that there is a directional dependence. Uh, okay, but now let's be a little bit more careful. Forget the anisotropy, but let's take the isotropic case so that all these numbers are scalars. We don't need to have nine to nine, uh, uh, three times three matrices. But there are uh, coupling between E and 
H and DMB. So in general, there are four parameters. We are familiar with this electric code, code electricity to electricity and these ones. Let's not, not, not talk about those, but here, there, I, for some reason, I, I now put this into this type of form. I have two new parameters, chi and kappa. And J, by the way, now J is now my imaginary unit. In electrical engineering, I, I tend to use this time harmonic convention E to the J omega T, which means that the J is the imaginary unit. Physics people they like to have E to the minus I omega T, but don't worry if you uh, do it differently. Anyway, this J, J now means that one. But by the way, don't, don't be misled. This is not a complex conjugate of that one. Because the complex conjugate of this one is, of course, chi conjugate minus J kappa conjugate. It is just put in this way so that for lossless media these two numbers are real. But why is there J? So this, I, I'll explain to you why this kappa is so-called chirality parameter and chi non-reciprocity parameter. This is a bit unfortunate. We chose long time ago that kappa or chirality. Chi be much better for chirality, but, but that's, that's, that's done already. Okay, so let me explain to you the thing. This is very important. It is connected to handedness. Remember, oh, look, here is a left-handed spiral. This is its mirror image, right-handed spiral. They are exactly the same, except that there is a mirror in between. And important thing is that you cannot translate and rotate and get to them to the same place. It's like hand, handedness, I, I, I guess it comes from green for hand. Like ice hockey club is handy. And then, so, oh, I don't know whether you play ice hockey in my country, yes, they, they play very much. Um, okay, but what happens here? Here's, here is a spiral, right handed spiral. If I put electric field there, I think this could be metal or dielectric. The electric field drives a plus and minus like this. You get a dipole moment like this. But at the same time, the charge has to go by a loop. And rotating charge is a current. There is, of course, 90 degree phase shift. And that is a magnetic moment. And if the loop is like this, it is in the same direction. So it means that it creates both electric response and magnetic response that there is a 90 degree phase shift because the charge and current is 90 degrees. So easy to understand that the magnetic, magnetic electric response comes by this handed structure. And vice versa, of course, then also. So, oh, this is a very long time ago we tried to also do this uh, um, experimentally. Putting this kind of spiral helices into a and a plastic, and then you know that the interesting thing is that the, the, the optical thing is that there is a rotation of the linear polarization when weight goes through a chiral material. Because, because uh, of course, in free space or water, the, 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 the wave retains its same polarization. However, in chiral medium, the so called eigenpolarization is not a linear polarization. Rather, it is a circular polarization. Or the two are left hand and right hand circular polarization. But they propagate with different phase parameters, depending on this handedness parameter. So if you put a linear polarization there, it is like a sum of half 50% right handed, 50% left handed. They propagate with different phase speeds, so when you add up them together, it has been rotated. So this is, has been known for a long time ago in Pasteur. <coughs> Pasteur in 1840s studied that time Malou had already found the polarization in the 1820s uh, uh, and of course there were no electromagnetic base but it was optics so uh, he saw that, that uh, and people knew that through certain super solutions the, the polarization would rotate but why and then there was another solution exactly chemically the same but didn't rotate but he, he, he then dried this solution and studied under the microscope and found that this so-called tartaric acid 
But the molecules were mostly right hand or left hand, I, I now forget, but anyway, it was an imbalance there. If you put 50 50 mixture, then there is no rotation. So that's why we call this very often Pasteur parameter. And indeed, in, in nature, as you know, there are many examples of this kind of uh, uh, unbalance. So I, I took this from an old article that in different levels through uh, nature, this balance is broken. So <coughs> seashells, they are mostly right handed. Not 100%, but mostly. Helicoplats and so on, bacteria, DNA, of course, is only one way. However, then there are some other types of uh, broken barrier. So they say the physics people, you know, even in the subatomic physics, in the weak interaction process, it is, it is um, they say, parity is broken. It means that mirror image is not the same. There is a um, the, the, the left handed. This is also a very famous fundamental discovery by Lee and Young, who got the Nobel Prize in 57, if I'm not wrong, about this. But it's really interesting. Why, why, why is that so? And all, in our level, how many of you are left-handed? Yeah, you can see the big, big imbalance. And, and why, why would the, why this, the world would work exactly the same way? Everything would be just reverse. I'm not sure so, so sure about the politics in the left and right. Is it? <laughs> but, but, but anyway, 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 that is that is something strange, but all interesting, fascinating. I don't know. So, but connection to the electromagnetics is this people call optical activity. Or well, the activity doesn't mean that it is an active material, but it is it is uh, lossless. But anyway, it is. Uh, I, 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 should, I guess I have an example here. Well, this, this was, by the way, my... I tried to... I have not seen very many seashells, but I, there was a uh, website where you can, I guess, even buy this kind of seashells. Uh, I went and looked. You can see Frogshell, clearly right-handed. Mal is by right-handed. From the chair, right-handed. There was one which was left-handed, but perhaps the name was also characterizing why, why, why it is not natural. So, so, probably yes. Okay, handle this. And I'm, I'm now on my story uh, towards the, you remember, bi-isotropic, meaning that we are still isotropic, well-mixed, seashells or whatever, but magnetoelectric coupling. And now I'm talking about this Pasteur arrow. And now I have to introduce a concept which may be a bit technical, but in, in electrical engineering people talk about reciprocity. But this reciprocity is a bit, bit complicated, but very, and used in different levels. I mean, you know, what, what is it, uh, you should talk to your neighbor as he, you want him to talk to you. So this is reciprocity. It is a bit more technical here. Here we, we do it in a way that we have two sources. Oh, we could have also magnetic sources, but I keep it simple. Now only an antenna here. J means current density, electric current density. A, this antenna A is here, creates a field EA. Then I have another source B, which creates field AB. And now I compute so-called reaction. This is by Ramsey already in the 60s or something. If I then integrate or multiply the A field from A with B current, so of course I integrate only over this one here, and then do the same, I mean, vice versa. If this equality is valid for all possible excitations, then the system is reciprocal. But if I can find a single one where it is not valid, then it is not reciprocal. Okay, let's get an example. This optical activity, remember my, I have now these right-handed spirals there, well mixed here. So, what happens is if I send in, uh, I mentioned that the linear polarization rotates, so it rotates like this. But, and then if I compute now this EA, 
So it is E, it's like this, and it's on B direction. So it had a strong value because they are parallel, these two vectors. However, if I send in the B way, it unfinds like this, and it becomes the same. So this is reciprocal. No matter how I rotate a right-handed thing, it always remains right hand. So this handedness is a tricky thing because electrical engineering talk about right-handed waves and left-handed polarizations and, 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 and then the definitions are sometimes exactly the opposite between different communities. Or even where some people talk about beta materials with left-handed media, which is then another confusion, but let's not go into that. Now, you may have heard about Faraday rotation. Faraday rotation is something that happens in in materials, then you don't need to have any, any electric coupling, but you have to have some kind of non-reciprocal external magnetic field. Like, like, like in uh, microwave engineering, people have circulators and, how do you call it, directional couplers, which use magnetized ferrite. So magnetized ferrite is a good example. Or another even better example is they're up in the ionosphere. Solar wind um, uh, uh, ionizes the, 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 the uh, oxygen and all the, all the materials there, and there is a free charges in the presence of the magnetic static field of the Earth. So it happens that there also polarization will be rotated. It is called parallel rotation. Now, let me see. If I send in now this like this, so it rotates just like before. And now I have a large value for this integral because this is parallel to that. However, if I send this, it goes like this way. And now you can clearly see that this must be in the sense of my definition non-reciprocal. Because now, if I, this is now the EB, if I multiply the dot product with GAAA, it is very small, at least very different. So that means that this is non-reciprocal, non-reciprocal and isotropic. Whereas the chirality was reciprocal and isotope or biased. Okay, so this is now the handed, handed media's uh, ratios. So we have this kind of cross coupling there, and the J comes from this 90, 90 degree pair. We call it post faster parameter. And now let me give you another example, <coughs> which is the Two to two, we need four parameters. We have now three, epsilon, mu, and half. What is the fourth one? And here I have a beautiful example of this one. This is now a thought experiment. Let me make a mixture. Here, look at the left side. I have a neutral background medium. And then I take, like my molecules or atoms or elements are such, that I take a permanent magnetic dipole. Easy. Take a magnetized iron, for example, a small needle, which has permanent, uh, like a compass needle, for example. But then what I need, I also need a permanent electric dipole. I think that there are electrodes and that kind of materials in which you can do that. But now the tricky trick is the following. I take a rope and bind them together, or I take a glue and put them together. This is my element, my atom, my molecule. And I have several of those, but now what is important is that always the north magnetic pole is at the same end as the positive electric. Uh, uh, so the dipole moment is, is to the same direction. Because what happens when now I put electric field here, say electric field, vertical direction. So what happens to a dipole in, in, in electric field? Of course it like compass needle, it tries to orient itself towards the electric dipole. So it creates electric polarization, but because of this glue, also at the same time and the same phase, you get magnetic polarization. Easy to understand that we get a cross coupling there. And the same if you put magnetic field, of course the compass needle goes like it, but at the same time and the same phase comes the electric dipole, electric response. So this gives a positive cross coupling, and this is now, in a way, a mirror image, but it is not a mirror image, because it is exactly the same. 
except that I have only switched N as to minus one plus. Of course, then it just changes the sign of this cross coupling term. So this is what I call telegen, telegen parameter. Why is it telegen? Oh, first of all, why is it non-reciprocal? Well, it would take some mathematics to show, but anyway, you remember that in the chirality, the optical activity, the transmission, linear polarization rotating, in this kind of telegen material, what happens is that the reflection is rotating. So if I send in a vertically polarized wave, the reflected has been rotated by an angle which depends on this uh, now this chi parameter here, which was my uh, uh, non-reciprocity, this number four parameter. And now it is for you very easy to understand that use this reaction principle. Send a wave like this, a reflection is like this. But if you send a reflection, uh, another wave like this, according to the red, of course it doesn't come like this because this is isotropic. Of course it rotates further. So then this dot product is no longer valid. It is not reciprocal, it just rotates further. So that's why you can believe that this is a non-reciprocal effect. And, uh, and why, why we call it telegen medium? By the way, it was, he was a, a famous scientist working for Philips, and in 48 he suggested a new uh, um, a network element. Before that time, it was so that uh, all the circuitries said, said that they were they were um, four elements in, in circuit theory: resistor, capacitor, inductor, and idle transformer. But he introduced the fifth element, which is now non-reciprocal, and and with that, uh, the the number of three elements in circuit theory became down to three. But this gyrator is a very strange element. It is in a way, has this kind of responses between the voltage and, and current. And he didn't have any physical realization to that. But exactly uh, what is needed, there is this kind of telegen medium type of thing in which the electric and magnetic dipoles are, in a way, glued together. So that's why telegen is a fair name to that. So, uh, the um, now we have these four parameters here, and, and if we still now want to generalize this into, into, into by anisotropics. So we have not only cross-coupling, magnetoelectric cross-coupling, but also directional dependence. Then, the, this is quite beautiful way of putting that. Then these are now, now matrices or dynamics. To put this like I had be, before the chirality, so if these are scalars, these are just chi minus j kappa. But now if they are anisotropic, they are matrices. And, uh, and then to put it in this way, T is a transpose of a matrix or a dynamic. And then it is well, perhaps not so easy to see, but anyway, you can see that the losslessness requirement means that all these four dynamics are real. And reciprocity means that that um, uh, the, the chi has to be zero, so that this is indeed the non-reciprocity chi. I, I have a classification of this one later. Well, the chirality handedness thing, of course you can see that if you somehow orient these helices, all are in the same direction, then you would get an isotropic magnetic coupling, which means that, well, this is my ingenious idea, I put that, Kappa, blue kappa means the density of the blue and the black kappa of the black helices. It can be different from the density of the blue of the red ones. And these three directions are perpendicular to each other. Okay, so in that sense I can generalize the kappa has three symmetric, symmetrical eigenvalues. However, a matrix does not need to be symmetric. It can have an anti-symmetric component, meaning that the transpose is not no longer the same as the original. And this is an interesting thing, and so-called omega medium. 
think of that, that kind of flat metal, which now the instead of being a three-dimensional spiral is a flat one. So what happens now here is that if I put an electric field vertically in the y direction, there is a 90 degree phase shift, a magnetic loop, but it comes into our direction, x direction. So this is means the cross cutting is something like this, which is surely well this is not symmetric but not even anti-symmetric, but if you then combine this into this way, you get an anti-symmetric still reciprocal, but this corresponds to the anti-symmetric part of the chirality diagram. In a way, diarotropic again. So this is one of our, 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 our uh, 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 classifications. So the epsilon can have the real part, uh, uh, the symmetric part, sorry, ordinary material, but its anti-symmetric part then corresponds to this parallel rotation of magnetoplasma. Likewise, in the, in the, in the new bias, the right, which the, and the, these red ones are, or the magenta ones are anti uh, non-reciprocal, whereas green ones, this is a, a totally the reciprocal thing, the chiral medium, our old friend, the, the well-mixed spirals, or then this omega that I talked to you just before. However, this anti-symmetric is fascinating because that is a telegram medium, which was my just thought experiment of these glued things. But, but there are in nature certain antiferromagnetic materials that display that kind of car. And, and the anti-symmetric part of this car is the most interesting. It is so-called moving medium. It's, it's, of course, there is an isotropy because there is a movement. Okay. Um, yeah, let me say, I'd really like to tell you something about my the computational thing. So then let me just give you one further example uh, of terminology. It is the following. The um, um, uh, physics people, these are famous physics people who wrote a book about uh, uh, electrodynamics, then they, instead of E and H to D and B, they like to say that E and B are the fundamental forces and D and H are the responses. Fine, that's okay. But then you have a different matrix here. They, they in this book, they, 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 they decompose this one to so-called principal part, skewing part. These are like the ordinary parameters. This is like the, those gyrotropic parameters. But then what's very fascinating is a single parameter is so-called axion. Axion is important term in, in fundamental physics, but let's not go into that one. It's connected to topological insulators and so on. But the in, important thing is the following. Is, is the, what would be the most simple material? Is the fact that this uh, relation is condensed to one single number. So the, this M that I had there before is only one single scale. So that is the axiom parameter. So in, 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 in fact that is the most isotropic material, even more isotropic than isotropic material in a way. What we call it is a perfect electromagnetic conductor material. Namely, it is the following then. If there is only one single material, it means that D is a scalar times B, and H is the minus the same scalar time E. Very strange because normally you connect E to D and H to B, but this is very, very, very strange. And uh, in fact, the function here is a bit complicated if you want to invert this one, because you cannot do that, except you can do it in a way that all these parameters go to infinity, because then, then then you can see go, Q goes to infinity with one relation from this one, and this is of course related to that one. But this is quite fascinating material because the, it is a generalization of PEC, which is perfect electric conductor, meaning that E is zero in good conduct and perfect conductor, meaning that uh, E has to be zero, meaning that the invert, if M inverse of or m goes to infinity, then it comes to P is C. If m goes to zero, then
then H is zero, and that means perfect magnetic conductor. Of course, uh, quite uh, uh, theoretically extremely important concept, especially in boundaries. But this is like a generalization of, of those PDC and PMC. And this is now like an extreme form of this non-reciprocal telegram. So, and then, by the way, there was a very nice idea that Christophe Calo in Canada had, had even made a realization of the perfect electromagnetic matter, BEMC, what we like to say. Well, this is a bit theoretical, but I like to advertise that because we are very proud of that. So, in the remaining couple of minutes, I would just show you this computational thing because I, 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 I know that you are interested. And that is then connected to plasmonics. Plasmonics is another topic that is quite interesting. Plasmonics means, uh, means uh, okay, let's go through an example. Let's take a direct sphere. In a way, if you put the, uh, the static response, very simple, Laplace equation solution, electric field, then of course the sphere causes a perturbation, which is dipolar. And how large is the dipole moment? We measure it by the so-called polarizability. And for a, here I normalize it with a volume and, and, and free space permittivity. For a sphere, it is extremely simple. Three times the permittivity minus one over permittivity plus two. So if it's a, if it's a free space, it vanishes, of course. Epsilon is one. However, what happens is epsilon is minus two. There is a very strong singularity. What does it mean that we have negative permittivity? Well, that's no, no big deal. I mean, many natural materials have that at certain frequencies. Noble metals, for example, silver, gold in, 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 in optical range. And especially if we have very low losses, like for silver, we do have, then there is a very strong, even if it's static, resonance. This is like a localized plasma resonance for, 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 for this kind of media. And if you compute the, for a, the dipole moment, if for a, a realistic silver model, there are some losses, which means that this don't go to infinity, but it has a very high, in the very close to ultraviolet. And, and, and by the way, I also then computed that for the, this was now for static solution, and static is very, of course, if the size is much smaller than the wave. Okay, you have optical waves, 400 nanometers, but in nano plasmonics people have like 20 nanometer silver spheres, and, and, and there you can see that the full me solution goes like this, there starts to be a, what we call red shift here, but anyway, the static uh, uh, approximation here is very good. Is the color called represent here? This is okay, actually. This is now the I'm computing the so-called scattering efficiency, scattering cross section. How much it scatters power for uh, incoming wave? So blue is very small, and then the white is highest. So it means that we can see that here at this exactly as showed before, there is a for small, small spheres there is a very very strong one uh, uh, scattering efficiency. Uh, well, I also, then, if you do the full me scattering, then I, I did it also. Yeah, this is the same color code here, the scattering efficiency, which means the exactly what I meant, that how much, it's like radar cross-section type of things, but integrated over the order by static ranges. And this now, as a function of the negative permittivity, and then also the size parameter, which is size, x is now the uh, 2 pi radius over the wave. And you can see that there are very many, many multipolar resonances here, very sharp, extremely sharp, that I cannot even resolve here. But the main dipolar resonance reaches strongly when we increase the size. Okay, so the, let me jump a little bit. I just showed to you the famous example. Have you heard this? Is the Lycurgus cup? In British Museum. I myself took these pictures. One, uh, this one with the flash, this one with no flash, showing that the reflected light and translated light 
have very different characteristics. This is like an example of medieval anthroposmonics, because they said that, and they have studied that, that in, in, inside this ceramic there are silver and gold nanoparticles. Yeah. And, and indeed, then people have been doing very nice things. Uh, here are examples I took from a, an article which has gold uh, hollow nanospheres, and you can see how beautifully the spectrum changes and the color changes. That somehow reminds me of another picture, which is the but I guess this is the last one next year. And, 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 uh, and the, okay, so, so if you allow me a couple of minutes, but this is the very interesting thing that I, uh, very recently, about our computational uh, efforts towards the plasmonic field. Is that Poland, we have Vasily Lajowe, which some of you know very well, has been developing with his colleagues uh, 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 software with which we can solve with the surface integral equation method of moment type of solution uh, all kinds of single scattering responses. We are, as, as you can see, I've been interested in these single scatterers and not so much in very heavy computation. We do these desktops. But, but anyway, quite nice. And, and then with this, uh, you can then, of course, see all the surface currents and so on. With this one, then, I, I was interested in, since we know the sphere, how it reacts in the plasma range, what about how does the shape affect that? So one way of doing that systematically is, is to go to a certain super sphere. Here, I, I guess you know that with this way, if you change with the parameter here, you can go into the cube or to the octahedron or even to the star-shaped things. And the interesting thing I was asked, asked him to calculate was how, how do these spectral things change with the shape? So, so in a way, with the shape you also can then shift the resonances. And that may be sometimes very interesting and, 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 and useful information in, in, say, some kind of energy efficiency applications in which you want to absorb. Uh, the energy for solar cells, some kind of other kind, kind of applications. Well, anyway, but now the very interesting thing is the following. Now that I talked about this polyhedra, I uh, long time ago, this was in 2004, with, with, when Pasi and Seppo and those guys came to our laboratory, we, I asked them that, oh, so I know you're so good in, in, in computational electromagnetics, I'm interested in, can we find out what is the just this alpha, this polarizability, which we know for sphere and ellipsoid, but for a cube, we cannot solve it analytically. So, okay, started doing so. It is, uh, and these five classical regular polarizability try to be So, solving this type of equation numerically and with different kind of elements. That was a long time ago, 15 years ago. But anyway, anyway, we pushed it so far that we could got very exact results for, for uh, and reliable results for all these uh, these, these uh, uh, polyhedra, of course, quite dull results. This now tau is the permittivity relation to the outside. So that time I didn't know anything or was not interested in plasmonic. So this is positive. So it goes from zero, it is like a PMC, to infinity, this is PEC. For a sphere, you know, 3 epsilon minus 1 epsilon plus 2, it goes to 3 here, and then epsilon being 0, it goes to minus 1 half. That is a PMC dielectric response. So, and these are not, not too much different, so, it, but the only thing is that the sphere is always the minimum. Always, any, any change you do, then you increase the polarizability. So if you relate this to the sphere, then there is something. And tetra, which has the sharpest corners, is, is highest. Okay, no, that was no, that was very interesting and useful, and so on. But 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 the curves are a bit dull, and uh, and then but anyway, it was very nice that we could get quite. I, I trust that four or five digits of, of these numbers. And in particular, and this comes now the interesting thing. I wanted that. Okay, let's try to have a useful, just like a pade approximation formula that, for example, for the cube or the others, I have a certain permittivity and the formula gives you me five digits of, of, of accuracy of the permittivity. So, okay, now it is here. 
So, so yeah, that was interesting, but but didn't, uh, but 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 then so, so that was it. And uh, then the question comes that what about plasmonics? If the permittivity with this tau becomes negative, so it was not meant at all to be negative here. But then that kind of approximation, of course, give us four poles. And now, nowadays, uh, uh, and this is my, my student directors who is now working on, on this one. And by the way, in, we have a formal thesis defense next month. And, 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 and that is our system of, of doing the defense is very formal. And I'm very happy that he is on, on that position already now. And, and he has been now working on many things, including plasmonics and this uh, cubic uh, or other polyhedra. And then, very interesting, he had been doing now with the, with the, together with Passi, with the new, new, new formulations, very heavy calculations on the plasmonic properties of cubes and others, and found extremely interesting resonances. So for the sphere, we can calculate those analytically, if you remember, minus two, minus one half, and so on. But what happens for the cube? And that is extremely difficult because you know that sharp corners and negative permittivity is not a very good combination. You have very high uh, uh, singularities there, and the, the numerical computational approximation is difficult. And that's why people have been working on these ones for a long time and have estimated what kind of resonances there exist and appear. And they haven't converged too much. But, but, but now, uh, Dimitrios has been calculating those, has, has very good thing, things. But what my most important message is here the following. That even the, the old article, when we had the fourth order denominator, which has four poles, and also predicts four uh, poles, I mean by the infinity for the uh, polarizability. Even if that was not, was not meant at all, to be like that. Somehow this, this function contained information outside its own, own regime, in a way. Because then, if you compute those, they, they could very nicely correspond to these, these ones that have been um, computed otherwise. Of course, you can see that there is quite a lot of, of, of scattering here, but that is exactly due to the fact that it is very difficult to catch these things. Uh, perhaps totally impossible for the absolutely sharp cube because probably the energy density be, the energy density certainly becomes infinite but also perhaps the total energy and then there is no absolutely sharp corner in, in, in the real life so we have to have p the, you remember the p value which gave the sharpness of the super sphere so this is something like 50 here so 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 then that means that that is not only the function of the number of elements how we do the do tensor but also the, the sharpness of the, of, the, of, the, of the element itself. Okay, so that is some th small things about that, but let me finish with my good friend Johannes Kepler who said that that would be material heavy geometry because I think that very perfectly fits into this one. So it means that where there is a geometry, there is matter and that is exactly what, what the message of this emerges is okay well, thank you professor for this nice talk so we may have a, a couple of general questions and then continue outside with tea and us. okay okay yeah yeah feel free to ask anything if you like uh, thank you for the uh, introductory and you provided in this talk, uh, it was very uh, teaching. Uh, so I have a question about this bioanisotropic uh, materials that you mentioned. Uh, as far as we know from antenna theory in, in uh, free space, free space-like spaces, uh, the most isotropic source we have is a dipole. Uh, but mm -hmm. even though the most isotropic source we have is the dipole, it is not actually isotropic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has a, a donut-like radiation uh, profile. Yes. So uh, I was thinking, perhaps with, with the, uh, because that, that is inherited in the Maxwell's equations. So if you have like a source like this, then mm -hmm. yeah, that turns yeah. out to be the solution. But perhaps if you have a proscopic 
something between the magnetic and the electric fields would be possible to have a at least time averaged wise perfect the isotropic yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, radiation profile mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. some kind of engineer source with <coughs> some kind of proper choice of chi and kappa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good point. So about the isotropy, so so in terms of the material actually bioisotropic could be most isotropic actually. Mm, in some yeah, sense. It's even more isotropic than yeah, isotropic. Was isotropic yeah. yeah, but that's absolutely true. If you have a, the simplest radiator, a Hertzian dipole, small dipole, then already that has a scattering pattern the side theta and has a directivity of what is it, 1.7 dB or something like this. And, and, and that is absolutely true because always an element radiates such that it doesn't radiate into its axis direction. But then, 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 okay. So, so if the if the if the goal were to have as isotropic radiator as possible, I think I think there are some powerful uh, theorems about that the impossibility of having having a totally isotropic radiator. But, they but yes, but they, but anyway, I would then guess that okay. So with the single dipole, okay. Now I miss this. So what about putting another dipole there in the same phase? Okay, but then now I, I had more in this direction than that direction. But I, have, I have given thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, I found a solution, but it becomes an infinitely many pole and it becomes very Yeah, efficient. that should be, yes, yes. And infinitely many, like if you have a sphere, if you can boom, expand it, mm -hmm. it will be a, like an infinitely many pole. And that, that, that also will be mm -hmm. isotropic, but it will be very inefficient compared to the dipole. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I, I think that then that's kind of practical. Always less efficient, uh, mm -hmm. less mm -hmm. powerful. Yes, uh, yeah, that is, but that, that is true. I, I'm not talking about engineering a, a source. It's mm -hmm. actually the engineering of both the source and the medium that through your mm highs -hmm. and commas, mm -hmm. we have actual isotropic propagation, like spherical propagation. Yes, yeah. so not in free space, but you mean the propagation through yes, the medium. Yes, we engineer the source and the space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right. certainly, I mean, then if you, this comes to this, uh, people talk about like a transformation optics in a way, squeezing the space or twisting the space in a way to, 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 to uh, tailoring and, 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 and engineering the radiated fields. I think with that avenue, it is certainly much, much more possible to do that in a very systematic way. Thank you. If not, I can ask another question. <laughs> yes. Can you go back to the uh, this, this slide with this deformed sphere? Or? Uh, ah, okay. 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 This one. Yes, so do we have some form of directionality dependence? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point, yes. You don't talk about... Mm -hmm. No, yeah, yeah, very good point. Because um, in a way, sphere is nice because it is so... Exactly, so it has so infinite amounts of symmetry axes. The cube of polyhedra or of the super spheres are, I mean, symmetry in that sense that, that the, all the three perpendicular excitations give the same result. So it has like, in terms of the dyadic or the, the second order tensor response, they are equal to, to, to uh, multiple of the unit type or unit matrix. So there are no, no dependence in that sense. Of course, then there are higher order, higher order non-symmetries. Non so, but that's why, I mean, I was interested in keeping this in this level of, of having the symmetry in, in the three directions, or I guess it has even more, you has many more symmetry axes also. Uh, so that we, we keep it simple in the sense that we only have one single number as a dipolar response to these ones. We penetrate from like a corner? Yes, right. If we, we come from this way, we can come from any, any way because... We come from a corner, right? uh, Even if we come obliquely, arbitrary direction, then, then anyway, the field that excites that can be always then decomposed in three orthogonal components. And since the the, 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 all these structures 
symmetrically these components, the response becomes uh, a single number. So it doesn't matter from which direction. A single number. Yeah, but I think that the, the source of multiple responses. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Is, but now I'm is only talking something between x and y and z. Yeah, so I should yeah. emphasize that I was only only now interested in the most important, which is the dipole component. And that is then the, the alpha is, I, I should say, dipolar reservability. Hmm. And then we have, of course, parabolar <laughs> reservability and so on. <laughs> yeah, good point. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yes. <laughs> sense that, uh, I mean, I, I, of course these phenomena are like universal, but, but I mean that, that if you so want to take, um, for example, a chiral particle uh, material which is, is created by that kind of spheres, then of course the scale is very, very important there and it is very, I mean, um, uh, 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 of course there is a strong dispersion, it has a strong chiral response at the frequency where this these, these helices are, are, are resonating, but then if you mean scalable by the sense that can the same mechanism be, be done for say 10 times higher frequency, then if, of course, then, but then one has to be, in principle yes, so one has to be then squeeze the sizes 10 times, but then of course have to remember that, that the dispersion of the parameters also stays the same, which n not necessarily happens, it may be that if we have a spiral conductor at a certain uh, way, but then in, in, in say 10 times higher frequency its conductivity is no, no longer the same. So in that sense, taking those kind of, uh, of, of, of things into account, then the scalability can be, can be maintained. So, uh, we will thank the speaker again. And before going to actually, I would like to have a group photo. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Sure. Come here and we will take photo. Thank you very much. Yeah.